little videos uh, to make people understand so that's that's the idea and uh, this will be useful for both the postgraduates and the consultants so welcome dr shawali dr uh, shahid rasul uh, uh, ashley alexander you see people joining from all over the world have you shared it with uh, orient you shared it with uh, all the groups huh? no no the the orient and uh, world dnt and also jr central yeah, just, just share it with the groups. So, okay, fine. So we are now uh, got around five more minutes. Uh, thank you, Dr. John uh, from Miami. He's a, a, a brilliant uh, person dedicated to propagating knowledge. He's got the Neurosurgical TV and you can actually watch this program also from the Zoom. You can come on the Zoom. Hi, Glade Varghese from, uh, uh, I think he's from Saudi Arabia. Glade came here as a as a visitor uh, to Royal Pearl Hospital. There are several visitors from various parts of the world, and Glade was one of them. Okay, let us now get started. I think uh, this is going to be a big presentation. So, uh, John Bennett, you're live on YouTube also, so you can see uh, uh, see if you want on the YouTube. Uh, welcome, Dr. Pranthi Anand. You are a very regular visitor. I think you'll get the best uh, uh, you know attendance award. So uh, good, good that you're uh, visiting all of our uh, classes. Anka um, Elant also is uh, wonderful. Uh, that's that's a, a great, great thing uh, to you know uh, connect with a lot of friends on the uh, Facebook. And in fact, this program is being watched by at least thousand to thousand five hundred people. And this is actually a very big, uh, more than a big conference. 
Okay, let's get started with the topic. It's actually 8.55. We are starting five minutes earlier and uh, we will uh, start. Now you can also see in the link, John Bennett, Professor John has, uh, um, uh, was kind enough to put it on YouTube. You can watch it on YouTube if you want. But uh, the questions, if you ask, you can only ask in the Facebook so I can see it here. Okay, let's get started. The topic of today is Mira. So what is Mira? Minimally invasive retrosigmoid approach. So I am Dr. Janik Ram, skull base surgeon from India. We do anterior skull base. We also do uh, lateral skull base. Uh, this is in conjunction with a team. We have a team of neurosurgeons uh, uh, in all of our cases. Uh, we never operate without neurosurgeons and uh, that is that's very important. And uh, let us now, I will start this uh, lecture with a case which we did yesterday. This is going to be a video of uh, what we did. One patient came from Bangladesh with a severe headache on the right side. The, the whole, if you just touch, there's a, there's a trigger zone, a classical of a trigeminal neuralgia. And trigeminal neuralgias are uh, most commonly due to uh, vascular compressions. The loops are uh, compressing on the, uh, the root entry zone of uh, the, uh, uh, the, the trigeminal nerve in trigeminal neuralgia. We will see one such video here. Let us now start this video. And uh, we, three of us did it yesterday night. Yesterday night we did this case and it went on very well. Now the patient is completely rid of, you can see here, this is the T2 Fiesta MRI. This is the, the MRI you should take. You can see the vascular loop compressing over the trigeminal nerve. And you can see how we uh, do, nowadays we have moved away from doing a craniectomy, we do a craniotomy. Instead of a craniectomy, we do a craniotomy. You can see that I'm making an incision on the uh, uh, dura there. We're rising a flap of the uh, dura. You can see that very beautifully that I'm putting a small gauze piece and then making a cut. So the scissors is used to uh, make a dural flap, anteriorly based dural flap. And you can see that we have done, uh, done a craniotomy and not a craniectomy. So uh, this is what we are doing. We've done several uh, hundred cases in our uh, hospital uh, um, of uh, various indications for the Mira. We will show you a lot of videos and this is how we do it. This is the dura. We are now, that's the posterior fossa dura. And now we are now uh, going inside. That's the arachnoid. Once we release the uh, cisterna magna, then you have the, the brain, uh, which is actually, uh, um, uh, you know, becoming lax and the CSF is released. This is the endoscopic view, that's a trigeminal nerve. That's a dorlosquenol, the sixth nerve. You can see that that's the scar. You can see how the scar is compressing anteriorly. That's the superior cerebral artery. And the ICA is compressing that. You can see very beautifully the uh, trigeminal nerve is being compressed uh, anteriorly. And there are two loops actually. That's the anterior loop, you can see that. This is the um, acousticofacial bundle, the ICA there. And now what we are doing is we are trying to release the ICA loop there. You can see how beautifully the loop is being gently teased off and uh, you can see the demyelination when you when you tease it off you can see demyelination and this we did yesterday night so that's why i thought i will uh, i will just post this video for you to see you can actually when you can see that uh, nerve the nerve is actually compressed by the vessel and we will deal with all the theory very soon i just wanted to start with this uh, video so that it's very interesting for the viewers to see how gently I'm trying to take off that arterial loop from the trigeminal nerve. You can see that, that's, an that's a microscopic view. And uh, of course, we use the pentero microscope. You can see here that this is the, uh, the elevator. That's the elevator being used. It's called the right and the left elevators. Gently trying to tease that artery. Be very careful when you try to lift that artery because it can lead to spasm. So, you can see that we are gently trying to tease that artery out of the nerve. You can even see the demyelination there. This is the cost, that's the high power. And you can see how that artery is sitting right over the trigeminal nerve. You see how that, you can see also that area, very clear area of demyelination there. That's the root entry zone of the trigeminal. And that's the ICA loop sitting right there. And you can see the scar loop sitting anteriorly. So you had two vessels compression on the trigeminal nerve and you can see how we have teased it and now we are placing the uh, block there 
you can see that the Teflon is being placed there. You can see how the Teflon is gently being introduced between the artery and the nerve. This is the Teflon being introduced. You see how the artery is being lifted off the nerve. Be very gentle. And this is done both endoscopic and microscopic. You can see how I'm lifting that artery and placing the Teflon underneath that artery. I'm using my suction should be at very, very low power. See how the Teflon is moving inside, it's sliding inside, that's the root entry zone of the trigeminal nerve. We will see all this in detail, I just want to start this uh, classroom with a video, that's why. Now I'm going anteriorly, seeing the scar there, that's the scar and you can see that there is a compression of the uh, uh, nerve anteriorly by the scar. Now let us see. Okay, now that artery has been separated now. And now I'm using an endoscope. You can see that, that that's a scar anteriorly. We have placed the Teflon here to separate this vessel. And there is one Teflon which has been placed between the scar and the trigeminal nerve anteriorly. But still there is a little contact between the scar, it's better to s release that arachnoid, separate that vessel, you can see that vessel very clearly. I'm now trying to release that vessel. So using the endoscope and the microscope, now you see it's completely released. And now I'll place a Teflon between the scar, that is the superior cerebellar artery and the trigeminal nerve. You see how nicely it is sitting there, wonderful. That's, that's a complete separation and today morning, uh, the patient was completely relieved of the uh, headache, the, the, the pain, facial pain, completely. You can see now the close-up view, how we have placed Teflon to separate the scar and also the Ica loop. So there are two loops and both the loops, are, that's the sixth nerve, you can see that. And these are the Teflon uh, which have been placed between the uh, scar loop. And of course, that's a seventh, eighth nerve complex. That's the seventh nerve anteriorly and the eighth nerve. You can see the Bremont's vessel. You can see that's the Bremont's vessel there. Very nicely seen. That's the Bremont's vessel. Can you see that? That's the nervous intermediates. And that's actually the facial. That's the labyrinthine artery going anteriorly. So anteriorly, you get, get the facial nerve. So this case was done yesterday. Just wanted to uh, start this lecture with uh, a video so that you can actually have a very clear look at what we usually do in a mirror. Okay, now I'm going to start my lecture now. This is anatomy. So neurovascular anatomy of the posterior fossa uh, can be divided into three zones. The three zones are the superior zone, the mid zone and the inferior zone. The superior zone, the artery of the superior zone is the scar, that is the superior cerebellar artery. The mid zone is the ICA, that's the anterior inferior cerebellar artery and the inferior zone is the pica, which is the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. The superior zone has got the following structures. The superior cerebellar artery, the artery, the midbrain, the superior cerebellar peduncle, the tentorial surface of the cerebellum, the three, four, five cranial nerves. So these are all the things which you have to write in the exam if they ask you what is the superior zone. The mid zone is the ICA, the pons, the middle cerebellar peduncle, the cerebellopontine fissure, petrosal surface of the cerebellum, the six, seven, eight cranial nerves. And of course the inferior zone is the pica, the medulla, inferior cerebellar peduncle, the cerebellomedullary fissure, suboccipital surface of the cerebellum, 9, 10, 11 and 12 cranial nerves. So these, this is uh, what you have to uh, now, let us see the endoscopic anatomy. So, the endoscopic anatomy is divided into uh, levels. The level 1 is, you look at the 5, the 6, the Meckel's cave, the Dandy's vein and the scar. Of course, I am going to show you everything. So, the level 2 is, you have to look at the 7, 8, that is uh, the facial nerve and the acoustic um, and uh, uh, vestibulocochlear nerve. Uh, and the uh, it's around 10 to 15 millimeters 
the uh, the cranial segment the ica and 40% of the cases the ica loop passes inferior to the 7 8 complex now level 3 is lower cranial nerves 9 10 11 and the pica and level 4 is the inferior extension of the cpa the uh, lower medulla the spinal cord the spinal axillary nerve and the 12th so we have four levels and of course what is mira mira is the minimally invasive retrosigmoid approach and uh, we are now going to deal with uh, mira now actually frankel uh, et al and uh, cross early in the 20th century uh, were the first uh, credited for mira for removal of a cp angle tumor so it was an acoustic neuroma for which mira was done initially and harvey cushing uh, he did a bilateral approach to posterior fossa using this approach of course dandy used unilateral suboccipital approach uh, you know dandy dandy's ligament dandy's uh, criteria for uh, uh, you know uh, the uh, csf and all this stuff you know that so the mira uh, wh whom i learned from was jacques manian so he's from france and his uh, teachers bremond and uh, garson uh, and the credit of this presentation goes to professor uh, manian jacques manian so now you draw a line so what is the uh, what are the things you have to do initially is you draw a line that's called the frankfurt's line it goes from the outer canthus to the superior border of the external artery canal that's the line this line marks the transverse sinus and then you draw a line posteriorly and that uh, posterior to the mastoid that marks the sigmoid sinus so at the junction of the two lines just behind it you make a one centimeter or 1.2 centimeter uh, a diameter that's that's the uh, 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 craniectomy you do but nowadays i don't do a craniectomy i do a craniotomy i do a craniotomy as mini craniotomy and of course this is the incision which you make from the mastoid tip just above the first line so this is the uh, um, the surface landmark you can see that very clearly now uh, number one is there is no dissection of the nuchal muscles limited bone exposure no or minimal retraction of the cerebellum of course you give hyperventilation so you have the cerebellum falling down of course what are the indications what are the indications for mira the indications are hemifacial spasm small tumors of the cp angle vestibular nerve section mvd for trigeminal neuralgia so we have done all the four indications at our place at royal pearl we, we do uh, routinely all the four through a mirror investigation of choice is the c uh, you always order for a fiesta image t2 fiesta t2 fiesta image and um, uh, so constructive interference in steady state that is by Siemens and fast imaging employing steady state acquisition in GE. So these two are the machines, Siemens and GE. And this is what, I mean, if you write T2 Fiesta, then your radiologist will give a, a very nice uh, view and show you the uh, uh, compression of the vessel. So CSF appears very bright. The cisternal structures, the nerve, artery vein appears dark in color. So this is what you have to ask for the T2 Fiesta. Okay, what are the criteria to say that this patient has got a, a vascular root compression over the nerve? You should have the following criteria, the four criteria. Number one, perpendicular contact between the vascular loop and the cranial nerve. Number two, along two perpendicular planes, you should find this. Number three is it, there should be a distortion of the nerve. And number four, you should have it at the root entry zone. That's called the REZ. So it's called the root entry zone. Okay, so MRI grading according to Crest is grade one, simple contact between the nerve and the vessel. Grade two is displacement, distortion of the nerve roots. You saw in the first video that there was actually a distortion of the nerve root. There was demyelination and indent in, in fact, it was a grade three, indentation and thinning of the nerve root. So these are the grades. Please remember this crest classification of the MRI grading of, okay. Now let us go on to hemifacial spasm. It is usually produced by, so if the patient presents to you with one side face twitching, you usually due to a vascular loop. Oh. Please understand it's usually due to a vascular loop. Some people try Botox and uh, try it repeatedly and if it doesn't work, then they can come for surgery. So what is the surgery we do? We do a uh, um, uh, Mira, that is a minimal, a minimally invasive retrosigmoid approach. So what's the culprit? The culprit is the pica or the dolicovertebral 
artery and in trigeminal neuralgia you can see that the scar scar means superior cerebral artery in 80 percent and the ICA in 9.6 percent so in the first case what you saw was a combination of both the scar and the ICA was compressing the trigeminal nerve the vertebral artery in 1.6 basilar vein uh, basilar artery in uh, a 0.7 percent labral thin artery 0.2 percent but there can be an aberrant trigeminal vein also that's in fact when a vein is compressing it becomes more difficult in our center we have done uh, a few cases of the vein compressing over the trigeminal nerve as well now what is the anesthesia about the anesthesia this is very important because uh, uh, you should ask about to begin that when you are about to begin the craniotomy you ask your um, anesthetist to hyperventilate the patient so that will reduce the brain pressure and you should maintain a hypocapnia of 24 to 26 millimeters of mercury so this is very important when you start the craniotomy ask your anesthetist please hyperventilate so that they give uh, a hypocapnia of around 24 to 26 millimeters of mercury okay now position what's the position of the patient patient lies supine sandbag under the shoulders and turn towards uh, the uh, other side nerve monitor we always use the nerve monitor in all our cases in uh, in our hospital that's very important to use the nerve monitors because sometimes when you use the endoscope the endoscope per se by the heat can cause a problem so you should be very careful when you when you deal with this area the introduction to vascular compression syndromes now let us go on to cranial nerve uh, so you can see here the usually we find the cranial nerve 5 that's the trigeminal neuralgia the seven is hemifacial spasm. We have done uh, four cases of intractable tinnitus, intractable tinnitus, and that was causing a compression. Uh, uh, there was a vascular loop compressing on the eighth nerve, and in fact, in uh, three of the four cases, uh, we we could relieve the tinnitus. Of course, we we were skeptical about it. We told the patient that you may not be relieved, and of course, glossopharyngeal neuralgia also uh, uh, there will be a compression on the ninth nerve and that can actually be due to a vascular loop. Cranial nerves, uh, something about the anatomy of the cranial nerves, every cranial nerve has got a cranial nerve segment, a CNS segment and a PNS, peripheral nerve segment. So every cranial nerve has got a central nerve segment and a peripheral nerve segment. So histologically, it is distinct. These two are distinct and separated by a zone called Obersteiner Redlich zone. This is very, 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 very important. So it's called o OBR, that is Obersteiner Redlich zone. So the CNS segment uh, contains oligodendroglia and the PNS segment contains Schwann cells. So this is very important. The OB zone, in this zone, transition from the oligodendroglia to Schwann cell myelin takes place. And so the PNS segment, that is the uh, PNS segment of the cranial nerve is resistant to compression due to undulating nerve fibers, organized nerve bundles and fasciculi and the epineurium is present there. But whereas in the CNS segment, it lacks fascicular structure similar to the white matter of the brain and it has a layer of pyre surrounding it. So that is why you always look when, when the nerve is just emerging from the brain, that is the CNS segment. And you should see for the vascular loop right at the root entry zone that is called REZ of the cranial nerve. Don't look for it far away. Look for it close to the brain. And only if you look for it, the, the OB zone is what is called the Achilles heel. heel. Now, the fifth nerve, what is the segment of the fifth nerve, intracranial segment? is 7 to 8 millimeters. So it has got a 7 to 8 millimeters. The seventh nerve is just 1 to 3 millimeters. So you should see a vascular loop from the uh, point where it exits the brain just till 3 millimeters. Don't look for it at the 7th millimeter or 8th millimeter. So for a trigeminal nerve, you, you can look for it till the 7th millimeter of, after its exit from the brain. But for, for the 7th nerve, you should look for it within 3 millimeters. And for the 8th nerve, it is 9 to 11 millimeters you can have a compression by the vessel. So this is all vascular compression syndromes. Focal demyelination is the cause of this problem. So why does he have a spasm or a trigeminal neuralgia? It's because there is a focal demyelination of the nerve. So that is why you have it. Now, what happens is that there is a central sensitization. 
hyper activity and hyper excitability of the nerve, non synaptic transmissions of the ectopic signals, and voltage gated sodium channels pivot if play a pivotal role. Of course, people give carbamazepine to uh, uh, to annihilate this uh, problem. They give Botox. These are all medical treatments. But of course, uh, uh, finally, they they land up in surgery, doing surgery. Now, what are the types? So, if you say it's a type S, it's the scar. Scar means superior cerebral artery. Type A means ICA. Type P is pica. Type V is vertebral and type V is vein. So when I write trigeminal S, type S means the scar is compressing on the trigeminal nerve. So if I write type AS and type A, for, the, for example when I showed the first case, it was a type S and type A means you have a scar loop as well as an ICA loop compressing over the trigeminal nerve. So that is, the, uh, uh, that is what we mean. Now trigeminal neuralgia, the first person to do it was Dandy who described trigeminal neuralgia and Genita was the one who popularized it. Now, uh, it's otherwise called Tix Doloro and uh, uh, it is a <coughs> facial neuralgia and Fothergill's neuralgia, otherwise called Fothergill's neuralgia and uh, prosopalgia and it is actually a suicide disease. It is more in women, one in one lakh population, trigeminal neuralgia, we are talking about trigeminal neuralgia. It's unilateral more than more on the right side. It's more on the right side. This patient also had it on the right side and a disease of midlife. Okay, now the pain is severe, stabbing on one side, just one half of the face, and it's lancinating and recurring proximal to distal. Proximal to distal. And it can be in any one nerve root, like V2 or V3. If he is chewing, he'll have severe electric shock like pain and that can actually give you a diagnosis of trigeminal nerve. It's a very characteristic pain if you look at it. Aggravating factors like speech, if he, if he talks, so uh, then you can, if he chews, if he brushes his teeth, he'll say, oh, when I brush my teeth, doctor, I had severe pain. Or if there's a strong wind blowing on my face, on the right side, I have severe pain. So this is actually a characteristic feature of trigeminal neuralgia. Now, it disappears at night. Whenever he sleeps, there is no pain. This is classical of trigeminal neuralgia. Now, and there is no deficit. The corneal reflex is present. No other cranial nerve uh, 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 deficit is present. So you have a typical and an atypical uh, trigeminal neuralgia. You have a lancinating pain and trigger zones and atypical burning sensation is actually a feature of atypical uh, uh, trigeminal neuralgia. Treatment options are medical. First line is carbamazepine, 100 mg BD. I, I usually st uh, start these patients on car carbamazepine. Sometimes I also advise uh, the patients Botox. Botox injection, we give it uh, for, for annihilating the pain. Of course, the treatment options are surgical, injection of alcohol, glycerol, long-acting anesthetic agents, and peripheral neurectomy, nerve avulsion can be done and percutaneous ablative techniques, radio frequency coagulation, balloon compression, all these have been described. But what we do in our center is a surgical decompression, it's called the microvascular decompression, it's called MVD, MVD for trigeminal neuralgia. Now, uh, if you have intractable meniors, if you have intractable meniors, we do, uh, uh, we first give the patient, uh, uh, you know, a beta histidine and then uh, trans tympanic perfusion of gentamicin, nothing, nothing works and finally the patient is having severe giddiness, then we advise vestibular nerve section. So how do you do that? We are now going, I, I uh, Dikshit Raj Mohan has asked, is there anything like atypical? Yes, I just told you about atypical trigeminal neuralgia and you just asked that question. That's good. Now you can see this is a teaching video on vestibular nerve section for intractable meniere disease. This will be heard there. We are going to show minimally invasive retrospective board approach. Hold on. So, Mira, patient. Now this patient presented with intractable vertigo, tinnitus, and moderate hearing loss. And uh, medical treatment was tried. Trans tympanic gentamicin was given with no effect. So. This actually was uh, referred by Dr. Vetrivel. Uh, you know him, he's my classmate, my friend from Virpuram. This is what we did. That's the incision. I already told you about the incision, the uh, horizontal incision, and then along the sigmoid sinus, you make that uh, 
two lines and then you make a small uh, craniectomy and you can see that we are making uh, incision from the mastoid tip just above the first horizontal uh, line which we make. So this is actually what we do and then what do you know it's playing or not? It's playing. You can go slow. Yeah. Let's see. Now we are just going to play that video for you how we did this uh, case, a case of uh, tri uh, vestibular nerve section for Meniere's disease, intractable Meniere's disease which failed to respond to uh, various kinds of uh, medical treatment. It's getting stuck here I think the upper border of the external canal and that's the Frankfurt's line projected backwards that's the transverse sinus and one line is drawn along the sigmoid sinus and uh, a point like marking is done just behind these two lines and the incision is given like a C. So the incision is like a C you can see that very clearly the incision line. So, the basically we we'll have to drill around the mastoid. So we have to drill around the mastoid emissary vein. That is how we have to drill this. Uh, we are going to see that now. So this is the idea of doing this, and uh, you will see the whole procedure step by step in this video. Now we start off with the incision. Now that's the incision. You can see here we are making the incision from the mastoid tip, and then. That is the incision which is being done. I'm going to show you a step by step video of how we do it. And we take a flap there, skin and subcutaneous tissue. That is actually the anteriorly based flap. This is anteriorly based. So carries taken not to injure the occipital vessel there inferiorly. Be very careful there. And then what we do is we use a bipolar and we cauterize all those bleeding points. And then we take another incision. See that with the diathermy anteriorly. So that's an anteriorly based flap and this is a posteriorly based flap. So this is actually basically to uh, prevent uh, CSF leak because we are doing a craniectomy and then we rise that flap back backwards you can see how we are rising that flap backwards and then that's the emissary vein you can see here at the center the emissary vein here is the video clear to you all of you there's a lot of people watching huge uh, audience so i just want you to comment whether you are able to see the video very clearly now we are drilling around the emissary vein mastoid emissary vein we are taking all that bone pit, so don't irrigate too much so that you will take a lot of bone pit and mix that with fibrin glue. So mix that with fibrin glue and you keep it in a bowl. You see that that's the dura, the posterior fossa dura is seen very clearly. And then you make that incision. You are seeing that you keep bone wax all around because you don't want any mastoid cells to get exposed and of course Now we are using a scissors to gently raise a dural flap, anteriorly based dural flap. You can see now. A pretty simple procedure, it's not a tough procedure at all, you can easily learn this if you do a few caravers it's, it's a generally very very easy procedure only thing is you should be very careful while doing it don't injure 
any of the veins. Here, the injury to the, uh, uh, sig uh, the, the sigmoid sinus is uh, something very dangerous. You see how very gently we are trying to raise the flap, anteriorly based dural flap there. See that? And we are now taking that. You can use either fibrin glue or I can use a proline, a 4-0 proline to suture that flap. That's a dural flap, very small crani crani craniectomy which has been done there. And then we will suture that flap and then we keep a, a long lint. So we also have some advanced lints like silastic lints. Of course, we don't use that in our center. We gently place that over the surface of the cerebellum. And the first movement should be antero-inferior. You should go antero-inferiorly. So what do you do by going antero-inferiorly? You are actually going to see the basal system, system magna. You are going to go towards the system magna and you release the arachnoid. Once you release the arachnoid, the CSF comes out. So once the CSF comes out, the cerebellum actually falls down. It, it becomes uh, lax, very lax and then you can perform your surgery. So the first step, you see that, now I'm using my endoscope. I'm going with my endoscope, and I'm going inside. That is actually the petrous bone. I'm going towards the petrous bone. See how my endoscope, actually Dr. Shilpi is holding the endoscope. I'm using the instruments. Now you see that, that's the arachnoid. Very clearly seen. The ninth nerve is seen behind the arachnoid. I'm going antero-inferior. I'm using a hook there and gently going to pierce that arachnoid. Once I do that, then the CSF will be released. See that? Now you see all that CSF being released now. And once the CSF is released, then the cerebellum, the brain becomes very lax. Now see, see, see how nicely the arachnoid has been released there. Now, once we release that, so that's antero-inferior. Then you shift your microscope or endoscope towards the antero-superior direction. The next is go antero-superior. Hi, Dr. Niaze from uh, uh, Senegal. So I have my fellow Niaze from Senegal. That's the seventh, eighth nerve. You see how beautifully you can see the internal acoustic meatus. You can see the seventh, eighth complex. See, that's the vestibular nerve and that's the cochlear nerve. The, the one above is the vestibular and one below is the cochlear. And it is separated by a small vessel called the Bremont's vessel. Now, I'm just separating all the arachnoid. I mean, that's the sixth nerve. You can see the sixth nerve very clear. That's the fifth nerve. So, you can see how beautifully you can use the endoscope to navigate and see all the cranial nerves. And you can see how beautifully you can... Oh, that's the sixth nerve. Wonderfully seen. That's actually the vertebro junction, you see that. Now you can see actually that's the seventh nerve, seventh, uh, sorry, the eighth nerve. The seventh nerve is anterior to it. And you can see now, there is a vessel in between those two. So that separates, see, see the vestibular nerve is above. The cochlear nerve is below. We are going to do a vestibular nerve section. So we are gently cutting off the vestibular nerve. See, see how nicely we can cut it. Once you cut it and use that small hook, see that's a hook which is being used and you see how nicely it has been done. This is the definitive, most definitive treatment for Meniere's disease. So that is, and you should see that you don't leave behind even a single fiber and you see how nicely, you can see the fifth nerve anteriorly, very nicely seen the fifth nerve and here is the seventh, eighth nerve, that's the seventh nerve, anterior is the seventh, see that, that's the seventh, very clearly seen. Dr. Jaishandran sir, thank you very much. You can see the seventh nerve, the eighth nerve, that's the eye cup, beautifully seen. And of course, this is the uh, craniectomy we did. And we have sutured the dural flap. Now we will re-suture this dura. We are re-suturing the dura. I'm showing you everything step by step. Now, once we do that, we will try to achieve an airtight closure. The most important thing is to achieve an airtight closure. This is very, very important. And then 
we have taken that bone pit because i told you don't irrigate too much just keep a little water and it's like mastoid obliteration the same thing we do here also we keep that in fibrin glue that is mixed in uh, tissue glue and you you place that bone pit like a bone so that bone is completely replaced and then a little that that's that's a bone pit you can see how beautifully it is actually been replaced there and once you do that then you can suture the two flaps that's it so it's such a such a wonderful operation and you can see how the fibrin glue is being pasted there and believe me after that your minios disease the vertigo is completely gone so this is the final court of appeal it's uh, we call the supreme court for minios disease now let us take a patient of hemifacial spasm now this is actually again opening the basal cisterns uh, just a view of the basal cisterns now this is the a uh, loop you can see the the seventh eighth complex i marked it also the eighth nerve and then you can see here this is the uh, root entry zone of the uh, uh, seventh seventh is here and the eighth nerve is here you can see all of it is marked that's the loop which is going there and what we will do now is we'll place a teflon between the loop and that nerve you can see how the teflon is being placed um, between the nerve and the root zone the loop you can see how nicely the seventh nerve has been separated and the patient was completely all right from the hemifacial spasm so this is actually uh, I, i want to show you a video of hemifacial spasm so you can see here 56 year old male present with history of left hemifacial spasm so we did a mira for this patient and you can see how this patient has got a twitch you can see the twitch see that how how the oh it's a severe twitch he couldn't drive a car this patient actually was from gujarat and he couldn't even drive a car because his eye was going in for severe spasm see how prolonged spasm this patient has and you see that it's continuously going in for spasm now let us see the surgery how the surgery goes Yes doctor GSN Murthy you should start the surgery believe me it's a simple surgery if you just do a few cadavers we did around 20 20 25 cadavers before we started this and uh, we always advise everybody to do it on cadavers before you start the surgery in life now i'm going towards the cisterna magna you can see that the cisterna magna and is doing being done endoscopic this is being done endoscopic you see here that's an endoscopic approach and and i have let out the csf the csf is being let out you see that that is the csf being let out and once you do that you will see head on you will see the 7th 8th nerve complex you see the arachnoid you have to tease the arachnoid you can either use a scissors a micro scissors and Now you see that 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 that's the eighth and that's the seventh. Can you all appreciate that? This is the eighth nerve. That's the vestibular cochlea and that's the seventh. See see how the loop is actually hitching over the seventh nerve. The seventh is anterior. You see how this loop is going right across the seventh nerve. Now I'm trying to release that loop. See that how I'm releasing the loop, very gently trying to release the loop. and i'm trying to, it was actually adherent and causing demyelination of that seventh nerve producing severe spasm i'm trying to now gently take that loop out of the seventh nerve and then i'm using the teflon and i'm placing the teflon between the seventh nerve and the loop you see that vascular loop i'm trying to place that there and once i place that there i'll bring that loop of course i can use some fibrin glue as well i can use a fibrin glue and now you see how this loop has come has been separated from the seventh now that can you all appreciate that now how can i share it on my department whatsapp group uh, i'm not sure uh, how you can do that my dear uh, shahid razul uh, you have to ask some it experts now here we are i place that teflon very clearly 
And now you can see that the loop is completely separated very, very clearly. Can, we, can you see that? Uh, very, very nicely separated. That's the seventh now, that's a fifth now there. And of course, this is the patient post-op, completely rid of uh, the... Uh, uh, now let us go in for another patient of hemifacial spasm. Now this is the, uh, you can see that this is the T2 Fiesta. Always look for a T2 Fiesta image. That's very important. Of course, I think uh, since due to lack of time, let us go on for some more, a lot of, uh, uh, lot of videos to be um, shown to you. So many, many videos. So if we let us see the left superior cerebellar artery, the scar, microvascular decompression of the trigeminal nerve. Mira was done. You can see here. You can see the T2 Fiesta images. Always ask for a T2 Fiesta image. That's very important. So, yeah, is there a chance? Jayanta is asking me. Let me uh, now pass that video just a minute. Uh, we have some questions. Let, let us answer them. Get them this link. Uh, excellent. Oh, so, yeah. So, if you want to have it on WhatsApp group, Professor John Bennett has told he has got a link and uh, you can post that link, Dr. Uh, John. I think uh, they can share that link. Now, Varun Ral is asking, excellent, uh, always a pleasure. Okay. Jayanta Nath Kumar is saying, is there any chance of that vessel getting damaged in procedure? If so, then what happens? Yes, this is a very tricky question. If you damage the, the vessel, then you are done. I mean, you, you can't afford to have uh, bleeding in the... Uh, in the uh, the level of the brain stem but the best way is you can use a, a, a bipolar but you might land up in an infarct so we use surgery if it's a vein then you can use gel foam or uh, some surgery cell and pack it and wait so that is better if there is a vein but if it's an artery a major artery which is gone uh, then it's being difficult but more importantly we can have spasm when you actually try to separate it I have seen right under my eyes some spasm if you use the spasm if you have spasm then use papaverin so 50% papaverin and place it over the artery place it over the vessel then it will dilate you can see that dilating so these are all like earthworms you can see that so um, can you explain the CT findings? Actually, I don't have the cursor, Dr. Prakash Munka, sir. Uh, I will do a separate class on uh, a classroom on CT and MRI. You have been asking this repeatedly. I will definitely do that uh, for sure. Now, uh, since I, I, the cursor is not seen by you, it's very difficult for you to appreciate what I'm talking. So this is how we do. You go around the emissary vein, mastoid emissary vein. That is your landmark. You, you drill up uh, around the emissary vein, see that, You're, I'm doing a craniectomy. At the same time, don't irrigate too much, don't irrigate too much, T a little bit of water and take all that bone paint. See that, I'm taking that bone paint and mix it with fibrin glue. Once you mix it with fibrin glue, what happens? You will actually replace that uh, at the end of the surgery. So that is, that is the idea. See, see that I'm taking a lot of bone paint. And finally, once you arrive at the dura, then you can use the diamond burr. Till then, you have to use the cutting burr. See here, I'm using a 4-0 uh, diamond burr, and I'm now that's the emissary vein, I'm right in the center. You can see that island, island of bone. That's the emissary vein. Can you all visualize it, please? Yeah. Okay. Uh, while Alab Bas, let me pause this video because he's asked a very very nice question. What do you do in case of a severe adherent vessel in dissection? Yes, this we face in a vein. Uh, when there is a vein, then there is a there is a problem. So if if it is like that, we have to gently try to dissect. You should not apply pressure on the nerve. You can apply pressure on the vessel, but not on the nerve. That is very important. And uh, what is the size of the drill? Four zero. I told you four zero. Craniotomy. Yes. Nowadays. Dr. Keval, we do craniotomy instead of craniectomy. For the past around 20 cases, we have been doing uh, craniotomy. Instead of doing the craniectomy, we have moved away from this and we are now doing a mini craniotomy. So that is what we are doing right now along with uh, uh, Dr. Vijay Kumar. Now here we are, we are now taking that bone. 
and you can see that that bone will be used during the final stage of the surgery so here we are we are using a bone wax why do we use a bone wax after this because we don't want any of the mastoid cells to get opened and finally landing up in a csf leak so we always try to uh, the next step is using bone wax to seal off all the mastoid air cells so this is very important <clears throat> now once we do that the next is the dural incision so you see how we make the dural incision I hope the picture is very clear, my dear friends. Okay, now we are using the bone wax just to seal off all the uh, uh, small air cells in the mastoid system so that we don't land up in a CSF rhinorrhea. And then we use a leaven blade. You see, I'm using a leaven blade. The, the answer is always hyperventilates. I told you, you should do hyperventilation because when we hyperventilate, you will have the pressure of the brain going low, lower. So, so Manish is asking, can we use some clips for the adherent vessels? We, we usually don't use clips. We, we don't usually use clips. Uh, yeah, uh, what is the size of the craniectomy? It's around 1.2 centimeters. Kevel, uh, Professor Kevel, it is uh, 1.2 centimeters, uh, the maximum. That is the uh, maximum. It's a very mini, mini craniotomy or a mini craniectomy, very small craniectomy. In fact, this is magnified by the microscope, but when you look at it, it's a very, very small craniectomy. Of course, even now, when we do the craniotomy, we do a mini craniotomy. You see how we're using the scissors, very gently try to uh, go and it's an anteriorly based dural flap. You can see that we are taking that anteriorly based dural flap. Now, once we do that, you can see already the, the cerebellum is already less tensed. This is because of hyperventilation. And then the next step is to go towards the cistern of magna. I told you go towards the basal cisterns. Now, is the uh, uh, picture quality clear? It's clear, I think. I, I don't know what's the resolution in the Facebook. I hope it is clear, I, I'm not sure. Now, we use sometimes the fibrin glue as well as well to, uh, to anchor the dural flap, anterior dural flap. But here we are using a 4-0 proline. And then we use gel foam. See that gel foam, we use it on the surface so that there's no bleeding from the cerebellar surface we use the gel foam and then we place the patty so we are just modifying our technique every day so previously we started with the craniectomy now we are doing a craniotomy then we start using silastic sheets nowadays we are using silastic sheets instead of the uh, uh, lens and we apply pressure more towards the petrous bone rather than towards the cerebellum that's that's very important these small points are going to be very very important so how do you stabilize the position of the Teflon? So basically we place fibrin glue. I told you I, uh, we place fibrin glue, Dr. Jason Murthy. The first phase, microscopic, second, yes, uh, Dr. Escherda Portilla. Which country are you from, Professor? Uh, I, it's a very, well, I think maybe from Brazil or something like that, yeah. Now you can see that's a microscope being used. The first phase is the microscope. The second phase is the endoscope. You can see here, that this is actually the trigeminal nerve, uh, neuralgia, trigeminal neuralgia. You can see the first step is to go antero inferior. You see that basal systems. I'm opening up the basal systems. And now you can see that I've gone antero superior and we have to dissect the arachnoid. The most important thing is to dissect the arachnoid very clearly. You can see the 7 8 right in front of you. That's a 7 8. Can you all appreciate the 7 8? Just go above it. So if you go above the 7, 8, you will find the 5. So you can see the 5. That's a, a trigeminal nerve. You can see that very clearly. You can see now that I'm cutting off the arachnoid there. That is the uh, 7th, 8. You can see that even the Bremont's vessel is seen very clearly in my screen. I don't know if it's seen on the Facebook, but then I can see that very clearly. Now, once we do that, we will now see that that's the 7, 8 and we have to go above. The trajectory is directed above and now I will use my endoscope. Now, let us see that. I'm going above now. 
if you have a small sort of you know dural venous bleed you can actually cauterize it you can use a bipolar cautery at a very low setting 20 20 is the setting you will use so that that's very important and the suction power should be very low so that is very very important the suction power is low and the the diathermy setting is also very low at 20 and the suction power at maybe around 10 to 20 that's it so audio is not working so Oh, no, Professor Esther, da, Esther is from Ecuador. Wow. Okay, there is a neurosurgeon infiltra infiltra infiltrating in this group. I don't know what it means. Okay, audio is not working means, I don't know, Dr. Jason Murthy, I am talking. I have muted the audio and I am talking right now. now once you do that, huh? you will now see there is something. So, I, there is no audio of the... Uh, self audio in the video i'm talking i hope you can hear it so you can see here now that's the uh, seven eight and i'm now going to show you the trigeminal nerve and the vascular loop over the trigeminal nerve you can see that very very clearly there Yeah, so Anthony says the audio is very clear. You can see that now, that's the trigeminal nerve. You can see that. And now I'm trying to see anterior to it. So you have the sensory root and the motor root very clearly in the uh, uh, cranial nerve segment. You can see that that is the nerve which is actually you most sometimes you might find the artery going anterior to the nerve that's that's actually the challenge real challenge when you actually see the uh, uh, trigeminal neuralgia like for example the first case i showed you two arteries one posterior one anterior posterior is very simple but the anterior one actually is more difficult you see how i am now trying to separate that artery which is actually intending anterior to the trigeminal nerve you see that now you can see that beautifully see that artery sitting anterior to the nerve i'm trying to separate that artery the arachnoid see that gently and now you can see now from the other side i'm separating the uh, see the uh, instruments these are very important this is available with uh, um, Metronic as well as with some of the very nice surgical companies so you can see that we are using what is called the dissector that's called the it's called the lateral skull based dissector you can see that we are dissecting the trigeminal nerve of that artery it is actually going the artery is actually going anterior you can see the scar is going anterior to the trigeminal nerve This was, in fact, a very nice, challenging case. I want you to see the whole video, very less edited. In fact, uh, oh, thank you, Dr. Aguila Sami, for joining, Dr. Professor Anthony. In fact, Professor Anthony has seen us doing live, these cases live, actually. So, the, the, uh, in the trigeminal neuralgia, Mahmoud Kibzai is asking me which artery. It's mostly the scar. It's mostly the scar. The, see, see that now. The scar is anterior. It's actually anterior. You can have two loops. It can be the scar as well as the eye car. So, mostly in 80% it lies anterior. See how I have separated the trigeminal nerve from the scar. Can you see that very clearly, uh, Dr. Uh, Sri Harsha? It's beautifully seen. So now I will place the teflon between the trigeminal nerve and the scar now. So you should be very careful when actually you are uh, uh, trying to separate the nerve. You should not injure the nerve. 
Uh, you can apply pressure towards the artery, not towards the nerve. These are all some basic uh, points you have to remember. Yes, uh, Dr. Mohammed is asking me, do you use neurophysiological monitoring? Always, always we use monitors. So we never operate without nerve monitors. Uh, in our center, we always use neuromonitoring. Now we're using the Teflon now to separate the trigeminal nerve from the scar. You can see now the Teflon is going beautifully between the artery and the nerve and to separate the artery from the nerve. So how do you retain it? You can place a little fibrin glue and once you place the fibrin glue, it is retained in position. So that, that's how we generally try to retain the, see, see, see how the Teflon is going right between the artery and the nerve, very, very clearly seen. So that's it, that's the Teflon which has gone right between the artery and the nerve and that is a complete separation. Now you will see that endoscopically also. We always put an endoscope. Sometimes we use the endoscope even for doing it, uh, doing the surgery. Sometimes we use it for visualization. Mostly we, uh, at the trigeminal we use more of microscope and for the, the, the facial and the, um, the uh, eight nerve we use the endoscope. So that's usually our policy because for the uh, seventh, uh, the fifth nerve, it's too anterior. And for tinnitus, any videos on what structure to decompress? Yes, yes, we have some videos. I will show you. I will show you. So tinnitus, we have, we had only I think uh, three or four cases, right? And uh, we did that out of the four, three got recovered, but one didn't recover. We gave, we always give only a 50-50 chance that the tinnitus can recover, and we should be very, very clear that. That is the cause. The, you can now see, now you can see the 7, 8, the 9, very, very clearly. You can see very beautifully the, uh, the anatomy of the posterior fossa here. Very nicely seen. So for tinnitus, or don't give any guarantee to the patient. Please, don't give any guarantee to the patient. So uh, can we crush trigeminal nerve with slight pressure? Uh, I mean, if you really uh, apply pressure on the nerve, it can get crushed. But generally, don't don't try to crush the nerve. Why you want to crush the nerve? So don't do that. That that's not um, the idea. Now we are keeping due uh, this dura gen. Du you see that dura gen. So this dura gen, which is being placed as a inlay underneath the dura. This is actually to prevent. CSF leak. You see how beautifully the Duragen is being placed. We also use what's called the G patch. There's something called the G patch. It's available in India and you can use that as an onlay. So the Duragen as an underlay and the G patch as an onlay. The Duragen forms a beautiful layer underneath. You see how nicely the Duragen forms and then you can actually suture the Dura and then place the bone plate over it. Okay. Uh, what is the answer? He's curious, sir. Please, this answer, I'm cu very curious for it. I don't know what he's asking for. What is that? No, you cannot crush uh, the nerve. I mean, if you want to do a rhizotomy, it's different. So, but uh, you, you just can't crush the nerve. So, uh, chance of displacement of Teflon, how long it exists. Uh, between, you put in a little fibrin glue, as I told you, put in a little fibrin glue and it always stays there. So, uh, Dikshit Rajmohan, sir, also if you can reply through messages, it will be useful as video sometimes gets paused due to poor signal. Um, yeah, uh, is there any place of partial nerve resection? Uh, yes, suppose uh, you have a venous loop uh, which is actually compressing and sometimes you are not able to separate the loop, uh, massive additions. Then of course, then you can you can resect the nerve. You are right, Dr. Prakash is a very good uh, question actually. Evam Hasan Ali, sir, excellent. Namaz, can do you arrange any fellowship training? Yes, we have fellowship training. We have three months fellowship. We have one a uh, one year fellowship for neurosurgeons and ENT surgeons. We in fact today we did four skull base cases. All, almost every day we do skull base here. So we have fellowship programs. You can apply. I will give you my email ID now. Uh, let us see a trigeminal neuralgia due to a tumor. So this is a very, uh, very nice case. So I'm going to put in my uh, email ID for you so that so that that's the email ID for you uh, who are asked, and you can you can see here. 
that if you want to apply mm hasan ali you can apply for a fellowship on this uh, particular email id now this patient presented with severe pain on the left side of the face she has undergone gamma knife therapy and phenol injections in various centers but the patient did not have any relief so this is a very pathetic situation and then what we did was where is the uh, this one uh, okay now you can see here in this video this is the tumor uh, i am pointing it out dr prakash munka ji you can see that this is actually the uh, uh, petrochlival meningioma this is a petrochlival meningioma you can see that's a meningioma i don't know if you can see that very very nicely seen the it's marked in an arrow also you see that that was compressing over the trigeminal nerve it has a dural tail it's a clear cut meningioma you will see the video after the exposure you see that now i'm going to show you this is the exposure you can see here that's the dura which is being uh, incised that's the dural incision which we are placing so can we use a muzzle uh, generally we don't use uh, muzzle we use fat sometimes we use fat uh, but uh, muzzle we generally don't use because it gets fibrosed initially it looks uh, very thick but later it get fibrosed so the best material would be teflon the second would be uh, fat and third would be gel foam uh, gel foam sometimes is supposed to produce granulations so uh, that is why we don't use uh, gel foam but uh, the granulation forms after 6 to 7 uh, months you see here there is hyperostosis here now that's a seven nerve that's a endoscopic view seven eight nerve and that is actually the uh, uh, a corridor for the fifth nerve that's a flocculus you can see that very clearly and now yeah matthew jackson we can use fat we can use fat we can use gel foam uh what are the common com Applications you get post-op in this patient's Dr. G. S. N. Murthy. Yes, we can get a no. Not trying to cauterize it. So in fact, I thank Dr. Vijay Kumar, who always, always works with us. is is a brilliant surgeon, and you can see here that uh, we also thank Dr. Shilpi Bhatia Sharma and of course now Dr. Sri Harsha from Andhra Pradesh. Who is doing a great job? Uh, learning a lot of skull based surgery you can see that i'm cutting that uh, we have now six fellows with us you can see here that uh, six residents and i'm cutting off the uh, the vein there and then cauterizing that vein be very careful no bleeding at all very important so when you demonstrate such videos any specific every day 9 pm i am live almost every day i will announce that and of course uh, uh, you see how uh, so every day 9 it's like coffee with janki so we we do we do a lot of such educative programs in our facebook uh, this is primarily for post graduates young consultants uh, who really want to learn uh, so we use our facebook to the maximum possible extent to actually teach and this is especially the time when there is a corona virus you can't move out of the house and this is the best way to teach so the um, virtual teaching classrooms you can see how we irrigating irrigation is very important to the brain 
keep irrigating, keep irrigating. And now you can see that once the bone is drilled, you can see the meningioma. And I'm now trying to use my bipolar at a 20 setting. The 20 is the setting, very, very important. Again, I'll try to expose that bone. So the, the indications like meningiomas, we do uh, trigeminal neuralgias, hemifacial spasm, intractable tinnitus, caused due to uh, um, vascular loops, proven vascular loops. And of course, for intractable meniere's disease, and you can see here that once you have drilled the bone, now you can see the trigeminal nerve, very beautifully exposed. Can you see that, Sri Harsha? Yes. Sir. Uh, this is the trigeminal nerve. See here, just below. I've removed that meningioma here. Can you see that? That is the meningioma. This is the trigeminal nerve coming into view. This was compressing all the uh, all the trigeminal nerve, and people were trying to give a lot of phenol, this that, but didn't work at all. So here we are, I am now trying to take off that meningioma completely. This patient is coming for follow-up for a long time now, it's around one and a half years since we have operated. We are now trying to debulk that meningioma completely and try to take off all that tumor out and you can see the trigeminal nerve coming into picture. I hope the picture is clear. Yes, I've already told Dr. Ashwin that we always use nerve monitoring. Kewal Sansia, sir, is there any chance to damage surrounding structures, nerve by heat produced? Well, that's a beautiful question. Actually, that's a beautiful question. So when you're using the drill, we always irrigate nicely. We use the diamond drill and we are away from the nerve. That's very important. And the, the shaft of the bird should be very short because we don't see the shaft of the burr. It's very short because it should not touch against any nerve. So that is that is all very, very important. Now you see how we are actually dissecting that area. This is a, a classical mirror, a classical mirror being done, minimal access surgery. And we are now trying to take off. And now you can see how nice that's, that's the sixth nerve. Can you all see the sixth nerve? That's the fifth nerve. And the, and the tumor is completely removed now. And that's a nerve, that's an endoscope, endoscopic view, the fifth nerve scene, the sixth nerve, the tumor complete, that's a beautiful, beautiful view of the six on both sides. So here we are, now let us go on to, uh, due to a vein. This is a, uh, this is a tough situation. So this is a, a tough situation. Okay, gamma knife was given, Dr. Uh, Shal, Shalinder, or Already gamma knife was given for the patient, already phenol was injected. Now let us see a trigeminal neuralgia due to a vein. So this is a tough situation where uh, vein, vein always is a challenge. So now we are going inside with a mirror, that's the minimal access uh, surgery. And now you can see here that we are now trying to release the uh, uh, cisterna magna, basal cisterns. And once we do that, that's the level of the lower cranial nerves, opening up the arachnoid, and now we are going towards the trigeminal nerve. Let us see what we, we are in store of. Okay. So Dr. Vikas Kulkarni, my brother, my close friend, thank you very much for joining. You can now see that this is a very, very peculiar case where we had a, a vein sitting right over the trigeminal nerve. So this is one condition which is one of the difficult conditions to actually manage. So it occurs only in less than 5% of individuals where the trigeminal nerve is compressed by the persistent trigeminal vein. You can see here that I'm trying to separate the trigeminal nerve. That's a dissector, nerve dissector. I'm trying to separate it from the vein there. That is the sensory route. You have the sensory and the motor roots of the trigeminal nerve. For those who are doing this very regularly, you will definitely see, see the vein now. See the vein very, very clearly seen there. Now, now this is the endoscopic view. See the vein very clearly. How the vein is indenting the nerve. So the endoscope is the best, best, best uh, um, 
visualization tool and you see I'm doing it with an endoscope now. I'm now trying to place the Teflon pit between the vein and the nerve. This is something very tricky and uh, the vein can give way very easily. Be very careful. Now you can see that we have placed the Teflon between the vein. You can see the vein. Can you all appreciate the vein there? Right there and the Teflon is between the vein and the nerve. See, see the vein there. Now I'm just separating the arachnoid, releasing the vein there. So this was causing the trigeminal neuralgia. And after we did this case, the patient was completely rid of the pain. So that, that is a very, very uh, a difficult situation you will face. And now we are again trying to show you one more case of trigeminal neuralgia due to aberrant trigeminal vein, another uh, trigeminal vein. Uh, case of course I think uh, we will uh, go for the conclusion because we are already late uh, don't want to disturb the MS postgraduates who are reading a lot during the exam time conclusion Mira has come to stay as a treatment of choice in many disorders endoscopes gives fantastic views to the root entry zone thus reducing the failure rates so please do not shun away from using endoscopes during such surgeries. This is my carry home message to all of you, whether you're a neurosurgeon, you're a ED surgeon, you're a skull based surgeon, whatever you are, but try to use endoscopic technique and that gives you a fantastic view of what is the vascular loop or a vein or what is compressing over the nerve. So that is going to be my main carry home message in this, the use of endoscopes for minimal axis retrosigmoid approach. Now let us uh, see some questions. Trigeminal nerve is stretched. Yes, the trigeminal nerve is stretched, but then you uh, you will not have a compression by the vein. Can the vein be cauterized? No, you cannot because it's a major vein. Of course, there are some veins which can be cauterized, but not this. Okay, Satinder Paul, what do you do when some arterial branches penetrate through the trigeminal nerve? So if there are arterial branches which penetrate through the trigeminal nerve, it's going to be difficult. Then you'll have to sacrifice the nerve then. So that is going to be our, uh, um, our technique. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this session on uh, minimal access uh, retrosigmoid approach. As I told you, we have improved over the years. We started around uh, seven years back and now uh, we have changed to uh, from craniectomy to craniotomy and now we're using silastics. Uh, we, uh, we use uh, uh, also some fat for some cases. So this is actually dedicated to uh, Prakash Munka sir because he was the one who asked me to uh, make this uh, uh, classroom. Thank you Dr. Prakash for asking me to do this. Of course, every, uh, tomorrow we're going to have a class on uh, fungal sinusitis. So that is going to be an exhaustive classroom for the sake of uh, 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 MS postgraduates uh, who are appearing for exam. So that's going to be a, a long question, fungal sinusitis. Uh, so uh, thank you, Dr. Prakash Munka, uh, Dr. Nitin Jacob, uh, uh, Mohammed uh, Awad. Uh, so chances of displacement, yes, sometimes you might, but then you put some fibrin glue uh, it doesn't displace. So that is the way you prevent the displacement. Uh, of course, we have also seen some revision cases where it has been operated outside, they came back and you saw some displacements and then you have to reinsert that and put some fibrin glue. What is the post-op care given? Of course, uh, uh, the post-op care is as usual, like uh, for any other uh, case. Only thing is you make the patient uh, stay in the ICU for 24 hours and then ship them to the ward. On the fifth day, you can discharge the patient. And of course, uh, uh, you give uh, uh, a monocef. That's, that's what we give, the antibiotics. So um, uh, what else? Uh, so look for CSF leak also. That's very important. So the coronavirus helped to improving the normal. <laughs> Estida Portilla, thank you very much. Yes, the coronavirus is uh, making us do all this. So in one way, bad corona, in one way, good corona also. So that I can meet all the friends all over the world and uh, we are enjoying the classrooms. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Syed uh, Monier Barry, uh, Rohit Bharadwaj. I hope uh, you all enjoyed uh, this uh, presentation. And I wish you all a uh, good night and um, 
The position of the patient, the patient lies uh, supine and the head turned towards the opposite side and a little uh, a sandbag or a small roll so that it's slightly uh, extended uh, towards the other side. So that, that's the position. Sometimes you use also the frame, the frame, the fixators and that, that's, uh, that's a better way. So Matthew Jackson, thank you very much. I end this video and uh, just a request, if you like this video, please like it. Uh, press the like button so that we'll be encouraged to do more and more and more for you. Thank you very much. Good night.